Welcome to The Art of Modern Ops, a podcast series on modernizing cloud infrastructure. Hosted by Cornelia Davis, WeWork CTO and author of the book, Cloud Native Patterns. Through a series of interviews with both visionaries and practitioners, she discusses hands-on use cases with those who've completed the digital transformation and others still in transition. Learn what cloud native technology looks like and what you need to make the shift to cloud native. Download the six reasons to start the cloud native transformation white paper at weave.works forward slash resources. Hello, everyone. Uh, Today on our podcast, I am delighted to have Liz Rice join us. Liz is the VP of Open Source Engineering with Cloud Native Security Specialist, Aqua Security. She is also the chair of the Technical Oversight Committee for the CNCF, and in 2008, published a book on Kubernetes security along with Michael Hausenblas. Uh, As a bit of a teaser for the future, we'll talk about it in just a little bit, Liz also has another book upcoming very, very soon, and I'll invite her to tell us more about that later. Liz, welcome to the program. We're so delighted to have you here. It's my pleasure to be here, Cornelia. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Maybe you can uh, add a little bit more color to my very brief introduction and tell us a little bit more about your background and what it is that you're doing. Yes, yeah, so I have been in software engineering for you know my entire adult life, um, and I got into containers through uh, a, a startup that uh, I co-founded with some friends. Uh, we built some really interesting container scaling technology, uh, but we were terrible at, at the business side of things. Um, and when that sort of wound up, I knew I wanted to stay in containers. And I ended up just really by coincidence being introduced to the CEO of Aqua. And at that point, I wasn't particularly, you know, security was a thing, but I wasn't terribly um, aware of it. And, uh, uh, but I really, really got on well with Draw. And then when I met the Aqua team, I could totally see the value in their products. It was really, really uh, sort of fascinating field, I realized. And uh, so I, ended up joining Aqua, getting to know a lot of, uh, you know, about cloud native security. Um, But I think having the perspective of someone who comes at it from a development angle, uh, which a lot of people in security come, you know, they're they're professional security people and they maybe have concentrated on that rather than the development side. Um, So that's been kind of a really fascinating area for me to kind of land in. And uh, I was able to bring my open source experience into Aqua. And uh, we now have a portfolio of open source projects that complement what we do on the commercial side. Uh, And I'm also, as you said, uh, pretty involved with the CNCF through my role on the Technical Oversight Committee. Excellent. That's great. And you are a longstanding member of the CNCF. And the CNCF is just over four years old. Is that right? I believe that is correct. Yes. I wasn't involved from day one, but I have been, uh, been pretty, pretty involved from, from, for a while now. Yeah. Certainly three years. (laughs) And one of the interesting statistics that shows kind of the scale of the growth of the, the cloud native community is that in 2015, the first KubeCon had about 550, uh, attendees. And last year, about 12,000. I mean, that is like insane level of growth. Um, And I I think that really speaks to the growth of just the awareness of cloud native and the whole cloud native landscape, both in terms of it's great that you talk about open source as well as commercial. Um, Any kind of comments on what the current state of cloud native is and and maybe speak a little bit to that growth? Yeah, it has been absolutely phenomenal, the the interest in cloud native. I think there's been a really fortuitous alignment of things, you know, the existence of public clouds, uh, companies wanting to figure out how they could take advantage of those public clouds and, you know, 
scale their deployments up and down without having to fork out capital expenditure on their own hardware. The public clouds give them that ability. But in order to take advantage of that, it needed you know, infrastructure as code. It needed the ability to automate software deployment and uh, it, tools like Kubernetes were there, you know, at, in the right place at the right time to appeal to all these businesses who just they, they want to take advantage of the cloud and they want to ship software fast. So, yeah, the Kubernetes and, and the sort of other cloud native projects surrounding it in the landscape have really been able to help businesses take advantage of the cloud so i think that's why we've seen the interest you know the the huge growth um whether that continues you know i i am sure there are a lot more businesses with a lot more software that will ultimately want to run on the cloud so i think we are we haven't seen the peak yet but uh yeah we're we're constantly you know we in the cncf we we've had the term peak kubecon for a while and you know we don't think we've reached peak kubecon yet um but we'll see yeah, yeah. i so my my money is also on that we haven't reached peak kubecon yet um i think that there's a lot more to come my, myself personally um, now, I think that the way that you characterize that as the set of tools that are needed to really, truly leverage the public cloud in a way that was different than the initial leverage of the public cloud, because the initial leverage of the public cloud, in my opinion, was, you know, to a large extent to take some of the things that we were doing on in on-prem data centers and try to do that in, in the cloud. And, well, it doesn't exactly work that way. And so when I think about the way that you've characterized that is a whole set of tools that were needed to be able to leverage that effectively and at scale. And I think about the cloud native landscape, and now I'm actually talking about the CNCF cloud native landscape, the set of projects that kind of fall under this category of set of tools needed to leverage the public cloud, or maybe even some other types of clouds. It's huge. And it's Mm. potentially, well, it's not potentially, it's quite complex. And that complexity has been growing along with the size of the community. Um, And so there's definitely some narrative in in the industry around, well, is it getting too complex? Um, And how do we, how, how do we manage that complexity moving forward? Um, One of the possibilities is to see some consolidation. Another one is to maybe see vendors that are doing some level of integration and some level of composition. Um, How do you see that moving forward? How do we, how do we manage our, our, our industry expectations around that complexity? Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult problem. So in the TOC, uh, the, the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee, one of the roles that we really uh, feel we have is to try to help end users navigate that landscape. And, and one of the, the goals of what we do when we take a project on board is that as it reaches, as it goes through the different stages of maturity, we have like really early stage projects in sandbox they go through incubation and then they go to graduation and when they get to graduation we really want that to be a signal to say hey industry this is a project a product project really but um you know a set of software tools that you can have faith in we think this is a good bet to build your you know your systems your your software deployment on top of and but graduated projects, well, first of all, they, they're some big building blocks. You know, we've got things like Kubernetes. We've got things like Prometheus. I think there's about half a dozen now that are graduated. But they, do, they don't tell the whole story. They don't give an out-of-the-box solution. And the other thing we're really trying to do with the CNCF is to say, we don't think there is a single out-of-the-box solution. We think you're going to have to make some choices around what it is that you need to do in your environment for your particular architecture, for your particular applications. Um, so we we want to make we want to offer people choices. We want to be able to tell them these are some good projects. These are the strengths and weaknesses of these. You know, using them in these different applications and try to help people navigate that. But then there's that whole ecosystem of 
literally thousands of other projects and products that are being uh, you know managed and run by different vendors and they're all also hoping to help enterprises solve particular problems you know vendors have little niches that they're trying to help people tackle generally um and it's it is complex i i hope that in the cncf we are somehow helping to bring some sense to it but it's difficult and i i it, it's a problem that i think we all struggle with to say well how can we present this in a way that somebody coming to cloud native for the first time like understands what it is that they need to do and how they can make these different choices amongst the different projects it's definitely not a solved problem yeah now the the number of graduated projects is relatively small i believe it's still less than 10 is that right Mm, yeah, yeah. I want to say it's half a dozen, but I'm terrible at yeah. remembering numbers. Yes, <laughs> it's somewhere on that order of magnitude. And so, again, when you compare that to the thousands of things that show up in the CNCF landscape, is that quite intentional or is that an indication of uh, the fact that we're maybe still in the early days of this cloud native journey? Um, is is Do you have an expectation that there might at some point be 20, 100 is there an idea around what the end end goal would be? Mm, right. So I've just looked it up. There are nine graduated as we uh -huh. record right now. Um, and then we also have another, uh, what is that? That's something like that's 12, 15 uh, showing up in incubation on the CNCF website. Now, I very much think that everything that's come into incubation we're expecting those projects to be on a path towards graduation we have some kind of belief that they're on you know things could go wrong some, something could go wrong with the project some better project could come along and displace it you know there's no guarantees but we we have some confidence in all of those incubation projects and uh, so our expectation is that in the fullness of time, they'll they'll all reach graduation. Um, ideally, I would like to say that eventually we'll have this sort of jigsaw puzzle set of the components that you need, and that you'd be able to easily pick out the bits that you need to solve your particular problem as a as a as an enterprise. Um, I think the reality is it's always going to be. There's always going to be some complexity. It's always going to be, you know, the landscape will always shift. There will always be new things that come along. Um, but everything that's in graduation, we think, has some longevity to it. Um, so the idea of graduation is that, you know, it should be uh, a kind of a stamp of de-risking, if you like. Yeah. But surrounding all of that, the, you know, the kind of hundreds of other projects on the landscape, they are some of those are projects that um, haven't been donated to the CNCF. So all those graduated and incubating projects are um, vendor neutral. They've been donated into the CNCF, so there's no one vendor controlling them. Uh, which, for the longevity of the project and for the community to say, you know, we stand behind this as a community project, that's very important. It's no disrespect to single vendor open source projects but i think you know if you use a project from a particular vendor you you need to know something about that vendor and and uh it it it, it has a different um, community feel to something like a cncf project where you know that there are people from multiple different companies uh, both maintaining and depending on those projects Yes, of course. And you're reminding me that uh, many of the things that are in the CNCF cloud native landscape are really, to some extent, it's a taxonomy in which even entirely closed source commercial products do fit because they are part of the cloud native landscape, even if they're not open source. And so what you're drawing out here is a distinction between these CNCF sponsored, you know, open source community driven projects maybe vendor vendor specific open source projects and even commercial products do have a, a a place in that landscape because they do play absolutely yeah and um you know there should be no shame in a company selling its products for money yep, you know, that's this, right this. <laughs> yep yep um but I, I think it's it is a very interesting uh area you know it's 
it's so much of the core functionality that you need to run cloud native is open yeah. source. It's become that kind of expectation for lots of these um, components. And I think that does raise the quality and it raises the agility of the projects themselves because if something needs to happen, you know, if, if a community of people want to change something, they can change it. They have that ability. Yeah. It's really powerful stuff. Yeah, it is. Now, one more question on this topic before we dry, d- d- drill into Kubernetes a little bit more is that you talk about these as components, as puzzle pieces. You even talked about them as jigsaw puzzle pieces. And you immediately conceded that it might not be as simple as snapping two pieces together, um, that mm. there is this integration challenge. Um, I personally am a big fan of that optionality, offering people choices. I think that's essential. I've been in the industry for three decades myself and and know that there's always requirements for that, that optionality. Um, now, does the CNCF, is that integration the, then left, number one, either as an exercise to the reader, so to the end customer, or is it left as an exercise to the vendors who are going to be the ones that actually glue the pieces together into, let's say, opinionated offerings? Or is the CNCF thinking that they might, in fact, do a little bit more to help on that integration problem as well? So I would say certainly today it's a mixture of companies figuring it out for themselves, um, particularly those kind of leading edge adopters who've had a lot of success doing it, but they will, you know, we've seen them on stage at KubeCon talking about the the work that they've had to do and the pain that they've been through to, to kind of take Kubernetes out of the box and turn it into a, a you know, platform for all their development teams. Um, Then there's all the managed solutions. And I think that's a huge part of our ecosystem enabling, you know, businesses who are not necessarily, uh, you know, software infrastructure is not their core competency, enabling them to pay other companies for whom that is their core competency. That's, that's a good thing. So connecting the end users to, uh, services managed services is is a healthy thing to be happening in the community of cloud native um now whether or not the cncf would ever want to kind of provide that integration i i am a firm believer in you know interfaces that allow things to connect together so we've seen for example the the cni the the networking interface um there's a new project being proposed at the moment around service mesh interfaces. So uh, there's a lot of scope for having pluggability. uh, And I'd love to see more pluggability in that sense. Uh, And I'd love to make it, uh, not me personally, obviously, but I'd love it if the CNCF projects were, you could relatively easily swap in and out different components to to meet your needs. Um, That's not always going to be, possible to come up with a you know catch-all interface for every situation but uh, that's kind of an ideal yeah um but i don't think the cncf is ever going to get into the game of providing a you know a full integrated solution of all the different bits that you might want we actively have as one of our um principles that, that we want to avoid uh running projects ourselves that pull these pieces together under one big umbrella. Yeah. But I love your point around pluggability. Um, I think that I I love that answer. Thank you. That is wonderful. (laughs) Um, Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's turn a little bit more into, you know, the, the most famous project that comes out of the CNCF and that's Kubernetes. Um, I'd love to hear from you what you think the top trends are that you're expecting to see this year, 2020, um, and then if you'll permit me, I'll just maybe tee up with one of them, which is around whether you think that we'll see any kind of Kubernetes native software. And by that, I kind of mean software that only runs on Kubernetes or something along those lines. Um, and then, of course, any other top trends that you uh, see happening in, in 2020 that, you, um, that have jumped out at you in particular. Yeah, so I think something that we're going to see a lot of this year is 
the developer experience angle and and this may speak a little bit to this idea of kubernetes native software which is i, I like the it's, it's an appealing idea um but there are a lot of people who are uh, I, th I would say frustrated that as a developer today you kind of have to understand some things about kubernetes and some things about yaml in order to write a cloud native application and that doesn't really seem to be the right level of abstraction you know uh, there's a, a metaphor where people will talk about kubernetes being the distributed operating system uh you know the sort of distributed uh analog to uh, uh, linux as an operating system and in that analogy you could say that the um uh, the yaml files are something akin to the system calls you know developers don't have to know about system calls and Linux or the vast majority of them don't need to. They have higher level abstractions. And I think we're yet to see those higher level abstractions really successfully take off in Kubernetes so far. Um, so I think figuring out what those abstractions should be is going to be a real trend uh, for at least this year. Yeah. Um, and another thing that's, that's, coming up quite as a, as a hot topic is the idea of how you um, discover and distribute the the artifacts related to cloud native software. So things like Helm charts, things like operators, um, maybe even security profiles. These are all things that maybe people want to be able to have shared libraries of. Um, so figuring out how we're going to um, enable people to discover that kind of thing, much like people can discover um, operating system packages it, it, on, a, mm -hmm. you know, on a Linux distribution. Yeah, no, I like both those. Now, I have to, of course, draw on the subject of security, because as you said, <laughs> despite the fact, and I found it, by the way, quite, quite interesting when you talked in your uh, introduction, that you didn't come with a security background, that you came with a developer background. And one of my personal mantras is that sometimes being clueless, and I'm not suggesting that you're clueless, but I mean that, <laughs> I mean that as a, you know, you not coming in with kind of this security oriented mindset and bringing a completely different perspective to security is hugely valuable because you don't bring with you kind of known ways of doing things. You might ask questions that otherwise somebody who's been entrenched in security forever might not. So I found that very, very intriguing. Now, security, of course, is something that people are concerned with asking about that just never goes away in spite of the fact that I think most people are, you know, when they start talking about security, they get this like feeling in the pit of their stomach. So I'd be really interested in hearing a little bit more about your thoughts on security and maybe you can even tell us a little bit more about this upcoming book that I hinted to at the beginning of our podcast. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I, I guess thinking about the book and also thinking about my background of coming to security as a developer. As a developer, as a, a, an engineer, I have always wanted to understand how things work. And I am very uncomfortable with the sort of vague you know, boxes on a whiteboard thing of sort of explaining how things work. You know, I want to know how they really work. And, and ideally, I want to see the code. And ideally, I want to write the code. Um, so uh, I've always had that sort of inclination to dig under the covers and say, well, if you understand how a thing works, then you can start to reason about what you might want to do with that thing. And, and in a security context, you can say, well, if I understand how containers work, then I can start to think about how somebody might be able to attack a container or how you could otherwise make a container go wrong. And that's really what I've tried to do in the book that I've been working on. And it, uh, I think by the time we release this podcast, it will be either out or very, very shortly out. So it's um, Container Security um, being published by O'Reilly. And as I say, I've tried really hard to explain and, and go into some quite sort of detail around how containers work and how some of the things like uh, uh, how container images are built and, and so that you can understand how attacks might happen and understand where potential weaknesses might exist in containers and then what can you do about it. 
Um, yeah, and it turned into the you know the, the point of you know security is a very important topic. I, I think you know in in today's world, no no deployment can just sort of rely on being secure. Security is everybody's business. As engineers, we're writing systems that hold people's personal data, and we have to be responsible about that. Um, so security is hugely important. I think actually one of the nice things about what we kind of now sometimes call DevSecOps, the idea that you know developers and security and operations folks work together, is that more people can take responsibility for security and that more people can understand the role that they can play to to help with with that security of the system they're building. Yeah, very good. And and I love the, this this the way that you've painted the picture of understanding that at the core we're talking about containers, but you brought out an example which is you talked about container building. But when we think about security, sometimes people have a very myopic view of, of security. But if we think about it from, if we put the container at the center, then we can build a model around that that says, okay, I need to worry about security when I'm building it, when I'm publishing it, when I'm patching it, when I'm deploying it into a runtime, and so on. And so putting the container at the center actually maybe gives us a frame of reference, a, a central point. And it, it, it's so much like, you know, uh, the software development lifecycle, that idea that, you know, if you can get rid of a, a bug early in the development lifecycle, it will be much cheaper than if you wait until it's in production. You know, designing something out is cheaper than finding it in integration test time, that kind of thing. Um, and the same thing applies with security. The earlier in the, so the design, the earlier in the deployment cycle, the earlier in the development of that software, the earlier you can think about security, the better. And one of the nice things about um, Cloud Native is the automation that is kind of inherent in Cloud Native means we can automate lots of security testing, uh, lots of tooling that sort of checks for things like vulnerabilities so that we can find problems quickly and automatically and then figure out how to resolve them as much as possible before they ever get to actually being deployed. That is brilliant because now I see DevSecOps, which of course is a term that I've seen thrown about for at least six, 12 months. Now I see the relevance and, and the sim similarity to DevOps in general. DevOps is all, you know, a great deal about shifting left. And now what we're saying here is that we're going to shift security left as well. Absolutely right. Yes. I love that. Yeah. All right. Well, for my last question, I have to ask a question that I think I hear a lot of people either expressing out loud or they maybe have kind of a gut feel, which is that Kubernetes, as we talked about at the beginning of our program, has been on this growth cycle. And some people would maybe call that the hype cycle. And of course, the hype cycle generally has a peak and then it has a trough of disillusionment. <laughs> Where would you say we are on this almost inevitable um, trajectory? Uh, where would you say we are and, and any thoughts around that? Yeah, it's, it's such a great, such a great question. And because, you know, Kubernetes has been so, such an exciting journey to be part of, you know, seeing Cloud Native taking off the way it has, I don't think any of us want it to, you know, to come to an end. Um, uh, I think, in terms of the number of companies adopting cloud native, we are still at the beginning of that curve. But in order for that to carry on, for in order for cloud native to carry on, you know, really being adopted by the mainstream, we have to tackle these problems of um, making it easier for developers to um, deal with cloud native without having to understand all the you know nitty gritty of you know exactly what's going on in a pod business software development engineers they, they should be able to just work on business software and not worry about the the infrastructure side of things i think if we can crack that that will really help to uh maintain the you know the, the growth of enterprise adoption meanwhile i guarantee you that the uh the sort of community around cloud native you know th there's a lot of people who've been working on this for you know 
four years or or substantially longer. Um, so I'm sure some of those people are, are starting to feel that you know the community is it's not the same as it was when they first started and um you know that's a sort of inevitable aspect of of you know the, the great success means that it's maybe not the same tight-knit community that that it once was so i'm sure that from a uh, particularly for the sort of early developers they've been working on it for a while the honeymoon period may feel like you know it's it's coming to an end but there's still so much more to come in terms of innovation there's still so much more to come in terms of enterprise adoption i don't think we're quite at the trough of disillusionment just yet i i'm an eternal optimist and so i i would totally agree with that and love it so much i, I want to see us continue to to innovate i mean i personally i haven't been hugely involved in open source for for you know, a long, long time, but uh, what we've seen in the open source community in the CNCF and, and and around Kubernetes is beyond, I think, anything that I've ever experienced before. So I I hope we have a ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, Liz, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your valuable and deep insights around the state of cloud native, the CNCF and Kubernetes. Um, I thank you so much and um, look forward to chatting with you more in the future. It's been absolutely my pleasure. Um, anytime. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to The Art of Modern Ops with Cornelia Davis. Watch for further episode announcements on the Weaveworks blog or follow us on Twitter at Weaveworks.